So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for attending our last career conversation for this year, which is actually incredible. Um, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our students. I know that you are very busy um, preparing with exams. Um, so thank you for, for spending this time with us. I'm sure you will be inspired. Um, and a very warm welcome to our panelists. Um, very happy to see Fiona, Danielle and Tamlin. Hi, good afternoon to you. And um, yeah, I think let's, let's get started because we only have an hour with each other. Um, so just to understand the, the procedure, how we're going to be conducting this um, discussion. Um, students, you are allowed to ask questions, but please feel free to actually type in your questions in the meeting chat. So for those that aren't um, familiar with MS Teams, it's the little speech bubble. You'll find it either at the bottom of your screen or on the top. And um, I have my colleague Azola, who will be collating the questions as we go along. Um, I've always almost forgotten to um, introduce myself. Um, my apologies. My name's Megan. I'm one of the careers advisors at Career Service. Um, so really delighted and excited to be here today. Um, and I think maybe just to yes, please switch off your mics. Um, make sure your cameras are switched off. The reason why the mics have to be switched off is that we get this audio feedback and it makes it really hard to hear each other. So um, please do that. And then um, finally, you will be asked to fill out our feedback form. Um, we really do appreciate um, your input. Um, if you can give us um, suggestions about other events that we might be able to consider, that will really be appreciated. So Azola will put that link in at the end. Um, yeah, so I think let's officially start. Um, a warm welcome to our three female panelists today. We have Fiona Bain. She is a medical scientist based at the National Health Laboratory Service. She did her undergrad at UCT. Um, she made it, majored in biochemistry and economics, which is quite interesting. And then we have Tamlin Shaw. She is the co-founder of Cape Biofarms. Um, her undergrad she did at Stellenbosch University and her majors was in um, the life, life sciences. So we're really pleased to have a little bit of variety on the panel and not just UCT undergrads. So welcome Tamlin. And definitely last but not least we have Danelle. Um, she did her undergrad in biochemistry um, and also at um, University of Cape yeah. Town and also she majored in genetics. So let's jump right in and um, go to our questions. So the first question that I have for, for you is maybe just to explain your career journey, um, you know, from your educational background to perhaps your, um, your previous jobs to the current job that you have. So I'm going to ask the owner to start first, then we'll move on to Tamlin and then um, Danielle. So I'll, I'll hand over to you, Fiona. Thank you, Megan. Um, I hope you can hear me fine. Great. Um, thank you for having me, first and foremost. Um, so as Megan's mentioned, uh, I did do my undergrad at UCT, but I actually majored in genetics and not biochemistry. <laughs> so biochemistry was Danielle's major. Um, so I majored in genetics and economics. Um, I'm originally from Uganda, so I actually moved to South Africa to join UCT. Uh, having heard somewhere in my primary and high school career about genetics and I thought it kind of sounded cool. Um, and UCT was one of the, one of the um, institutions on the continent because I was very keen to remain in Africa, still am. Um, so I decided that this would be uh, my new home. Uh, so I did undergrad uh, in genetics and economics, as I mentioned, economics was a little bit of an anomaly because I really didn't want to do physics in undergrad. <laughs> so um, when I sat down with a career advisor, um, we kind of looked at what else was, what else could fit into the timetable because as, uh, as I'm sure most of the students will know, um, a science, a BSc, uh, doesn't leave you a lot of leeway in terms of scheduling and etc. You have lectures and tutorials and lab uh, sessions all day, every day. Um, so economics was pretty much the only subject 
uh, that I could do in place of physics, simply because of the number of students registered for economics um, being so uh, enormous. They had a lecture on economics every hour of the day. <laughs> so that's kind of how I ended up doing economics. I haven't used it yet. Um, practically, but I'm hoping that at some point it will come in handy somewhere when I start my own business or something. Um, and uh, so I then, when I finished my undergrad, um, then decided that I would like to do something more translatable. Um, so I moved to the medical school to join the division of human genetics um, and then did honors in human genetics, masters and PhD. So I kind of went straight through um, from undergrad all the way to PhD. When I finished that, um, I thought uh, I'd like to stay in research. Um, I'd had some questions being thrown up from the work that I'd done in my PhD um, and decided that one of the people that I'd worked with would be a good mentor and a, big, and a good collaborator to work with. So I then applied for a postdoc fellowship uh, which was funded by the Claude Leon Foundation and moved to Johannesburg. So having packed up my life from Uganda, moved to Cape Town um, 10 years, 10, 11 years in Cape Town. Um, I then packed up again and moved my life to Johannesburg. <laughs> um, and this time with husband in tow, uh, which was great. Um, so I then did a postdoc for about a year, for two years with Amanda Kraus. Um, here in Johannesburg at Witts University. And um, I followed that up with uh, a managerial uh, post, still as a postdoc, um, but this time managing uh, a big research um, grant and a big research project. Um, so unfortunately, in the course of all of that, I kind of uh, fell behind on my research. I uh, was not very successful in getting additional funding, um, which happens <laughs> and it's okay. Um, so I then, for the first time in my life, actually this year, got a proper job, a proper grown-up job. Um, so I now pay taxes and everything, uh, <laughs> which is not so exciting. Um, but yeah, so my current role is as a medical scientist at the National Health Laboratory Service. And um, I do a little bit of diagnostic service and a little bit of research um, kind of on the side. And yeah, I think that's that's it. Back to you, Megan. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds really exciting um, career journey you've had thus far. Um, so I would like to call on Tamlin um, to share her career journey with us. Or perhaps we can move over to Danil. Okay, I see, I see Tamlin's there. Hi, you have to unmute Tamlin. <laughs> Hi, sorry about that. I started don't, coming in French and I, I had to move. <laughs> oh, don't, don't worry, that's perfectly okay. fine. Over to you. Sure. Yeah, so yeah, thanks Fiona. It was really interesting hearing about your story. Um, so for me, I, I did my undergrad at Stellenbosch University in uh, Human Life Sciences. Um, and then I actually decided the Afrikaans was getting a, a bit too much for me. Um, so I, I moved back to, to Cape Town and I did my honours at UCT in, in biochemistry, um, as well as my master's. And yeah, I think that's where I've also met uh, uh, both of you. I've seen you around. Um, so yeah, and then I actually started my PhD in um, biochemistry and um, it, it actually just didn't go as well as I was hoping. Um, it, you know, there were quite a few stumbling blocks that happened during, uh, during my, my PhD project. Um, I landed up uh, moving projects and labs halfway through and trying to start again. Um, but by that time, I actually, um, I was a bit, I, I kind of realized that I wasn't really made for the academic path. Um, I, I kind of was starting to get very interested in, in teaching and I, I was finding myself being way too talkative uh, <laughs> for the lab. Um, <laughs> and uh, the project I, I realized wasn't really um, translatable. So that's also where I kind of uh, agree with you, Fiona, where I, I feel that science should really have an, an impact on the world and, and help people. Um, otherwise, I, I, I don't really see the point of it. 
So yeah, I decided to take a bit of a bold move and actually leave my PhD um, and go become a, a science teacher for a little bit. Um, I traveled to Thailand and I taught science for a year at a high school, which was really fun. Got back to basics, um, learned a lot about um, you know, people skills, communication of science, um, project management, time management. Um, and yeah, uh, I kind of, yeah, I, I realized that I do love science, but I was not always uh, made to be a, a researcher. So that's okay. Everybody's different um, and we all have different skills. So it's really about seeing where, where you fit in and where your talents are, are most useful. Um, so yeah, after that, I actually, uh, my mom and I went to a TEDx talk in Cape Town where Professor Ed Rabisky was um, talking about making um, vaccines in tobacco plants. Um, this research they were doing at the biofarming research unit uh, um, at Upper Campus. And he was saying that nobody was commercializing this technology in South Africa. And uh, my mom and I both looked at each other and we thought, you know, this is crazy. All of this amazing IP being developed by a local university is just going overseas and, and it's not benefiting Africa. Um, so we decided uh, let's um, apply for a grant from the government um, <laughs> and let's uh, start a business. So yeah, uh, never thought we'd actually get it, but we, we managed to get a Thrip DTI grant um, and yeah, the rest is history. So yeah, it's, it's been a crazy journey. So <laughs> well, that's another interesting story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, over to, to you, Danal. Oh, it, it's very soft. You're going to have to shout over your mic. I'm so sorry. Sorry, everyone. A little bit You're closer. see a very up close and personal view, just so I can get <laughs> closer to my mic. Um, okay. So, yeah, I really enjoyed biology in high school. It was my favorite subject. Um, so I always really considered doing a science degree. And then I took a gap year after school because I felt like I needed a break. So I went to the UK and worked in London for a year. And I came back to UCT and followed a very similar path to Fiona. So um, we spent a lot of time sitting next to each other. Um, did my BSc undergrad, then also moved over to the medical school to the division of human genetics, did my honors, masters and PhD. Um, and then did a postdoc with the Division of um, Department of Neurology for a year when um, the job that I'm currently in was advertised um, through PathCare, so that's a private diagnostic laboratory and pathology laboratory. It became available and I thought that it looked like a really cool job. Um, so I applied, not really thinking that I would get it, but I did. So yeah, that's where I am now. And I've been here for the last almost five years. So th thank you for that, Danelle. So definitely, um, I think something for the, the students to take away from what you've all said is that it's not always a direct path. There's a journey that you take to get to where you're at um, at this present moment in time. So. Um, my next question to all of you would be, um, you know, tell us a little bit about the organization that you're currently working for and the role that you actually have. Um, so let's um, stay with Danielle and then we'll move to Fiona and then we'll jump to um, Tamlin. Thanks. Sure. So like I mentioned, I work for PathCare, which is a private diagnostic and pathology laboratory. So typically pathology laboratories are involved in doing all the routine blood tests and other tests that your doctor would normally order for you and that hospitals need. So blood tests, um, tissue tests, microbiology, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. We do have a molecular department, so that's where I work. We do all the diagnostic testing um, that use molecular techniques for both infectious diseases and human genetics. So I work in the, the human genetics component of that. 
Um, yeah, and my job role here, I'm my job title is a technical consultant, which doesn't necessarily tell you a lot about what I actually do. Um, but I'm primarily involved in R&D, so research and development. So my primary role is to research and implement new tests that then go into routine diagnostic use. And through that process, I need to oversee the validation of those tests. So obviously, before we can offer any test to anyone, we need to make sure that it does what it's supposed to do and that it's reliable and sensitive and cost effective, etc. So I oversee that full um, validation process. And then before I hand over to our routine lab for implementation. And then I'm also involved in some sort of higher level um, analysis of some of our more complicated routine work, so next generation sequencing. Um, also some training of staff, advanced troubleshooting, et cetera. But that's, yeah, that's my main, my main roles and focus. Very, very interesting. Um, thanks, Daniel. So over to you, Fiona. Uh, thanks, Megan. And you're making this very easy for me because um, the following on Danielle means that I can just kind of go what Danielle said. <laughs> um, so, as I mentioned, I currently work for the National Health Laboratory Service. Um, the NHLS is, and I'm at the Division of Human Genetics, so the NHLS is a really large um, government organization. It does pretty much all of the laboratory testing service um, for the entire country in the public sector. Um, so at the Division of Human Genetics uh, in Johannesburg, so we are um, the largest uh, molecular diagnostic lab um, in the country. So we get, um, at the division, we get referrals from um, most of the provinces, so most of the nine provinces actually send um, any samples that are that um, a doctor has reason to suspect um, that the patient may have something that is genetic. Um, those samples come into to us at the lab. Um, I also work very closely with an amazing team of doctors. So these are medical geneticists and they go out to the tertiary hospitals in and around Johannesburg. Um, and those are really also referral centers for um, a lot of the smaller hospitals. Um, and again, I think, I think it's really um, similar to what Danielle does, so my particular role, because as a medical scientist, I oversee um, the technical, some technical aspects of the lab, uh, we all, we're always trying to improve the service that we offer to our patients. So I'm currently uh, in the process of validating um, some up-to-date um, testing guidelines for um, a test that for chromosomal abnormalities, uh, which I'm finding actually very interesting and very exciting. And I think as uh, maybe just uh, in this in this particular setting, nothing is static. There's a lot of movement, a lot of changing. Um, every day is different. Um, because the NHLS, because the Division of Human Genetics at the NHLS is very um, closely affiliated with the Wits University, we also do teaching and training of students. We also do training of um, interns as medical scientists. Um, so there's a lot of different things going on on any given day, in any given week. Um, but as I mentioned, I think at the beginning in, in my introduction, I do do um, both the diagnostic service as well as my own personal research. And then the third component really would be um, the teaching and training of students and um, interns. And I think that's, I'll stop there. I'm, I can see a whole bunch of questions already popping up in the chat. So I'll, I'll <laughs> back to you. You see it flying onto the screen. Um, thank you so much, Fiona. So so similar yet different um, with the two jobs that you have and the context um, that you're working in, in terms of the, the service that you're providing. Um, so I'm going to stop there and hand over to Tamlin. Thanks, Tamlin.
Great, yeah, thanks, Megan. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, my mother, Belinda, and I, we, we started a, a small biotech company in 2018. Um, we opened our doors in the, the powder mill, which is in Ndebeni, next to Pinelands. Um, and we started with a team of uh, two scientists, um, myself, uh, my mother, and Tracy, who was our kind of office manager. So there were only a few of us and um, an empty warehouse and an empty office. Um, and yeah, so in those days, it was literally doing whatever was needed. And it was such an amazing experience. Um, well, so far it has been and it continues to be um, because I'm just learning so many different um, facets of, of running a business, you know, from making purchase orders to uh, building a lab from scratch. So we, we ordered uh, lab equipment and we had to think about everything, you know, designing the flow of the lab. Um, we built a, an indoor hydroponic grow room. Um, so just for those that, that, that don't know, um, this this company, Cape Biofarms, uh, it commercialized the technology from the biofarming research unit, which is to make um, recombinant proteins in plants. So proteins such as antibodies and antigens uh, are normally made in either bacteria or mammalian cells or in yeast. Um, so the biofarming research unit or brew, um, they found a way to make it in plants um, and they perfected this over about 20 years. So we started off just making um, as many different proteins uh, as we could. Um, we thought we would make um, secondary antibodies, antibodies that are used commonly by researchers. Um, and we started a marketing campaign. We got t-shirts made. We went to all the um, local labs that we could visit and uh, gave them samples. Um, and we were actually just gearing up to yeah, you know, do a whole big marketing campaign with our 20 different antibody products. Uh, that was our plan, but I think uh, a lot of stories this year start like this. We had a plan and then COVID happened um, and then all plans just went out the window. Um, <laughs> so we, we had to just uh, respond quickly and say, you know, what can we do in this crisis uh, to help? Um, so we, we quickly found the, the gene sequence for um, the, the spike protein of COVID, so the S1 and the RBD. Um, and we put it in our expression vector and um, infected the plants. Um, and we made the, the antigens um, of COVID, so the spike and the RBD antigen. Um, so that was really exciting. And then we thought, OK, let's just send these samples of this protein out to as many different labs and test kit manufacturers as we can and let them test it. Because, you know, the best way to see if it works as a diagnostic is on a, a, a rapid test kit or a lateral flow device. So we just um, uh, pollinated uh, free samples everywhere. <laughs> and uh, yeah, luckily it, it actually uh, worked really well. So we've partnered with two local test kit manufacturers here in Cape Town, um, and they've managed to make now an antibody test kit. Um, and next we, we're trying to do the antibody test, uh, the antigen test kit with our antibodies. Um, so yeah, I think we're just trying to you know, be a, a company that that responds quickly to to the market demand, um, and you know, do our bit to to, to help because I think testing um, is really really important in managing a, a pandemic. Um, so yeah, I think my my role I, I literally just every day wake up and say what what is needed of me. You know, <laughs> I'll do anything. I'll I'll move fridges. I'll uh, you know sow seeds. I'll I'll do whatever's needed. So yeah, I, I like. Uh, doing different things every day. So that's, yeah, it's kind of my role at the moment is um, managing the science team, um, you know, getting them to uh, respond to market demand. Um, you know, they, they, they are still scientists and they, they do love what they do. So I have to keep redirecting uh, towards the, what the customer needs, um, as well as kind of building the facility, getting operations running. Um, we're starting to now split production and R&D. Uh, so that's quite exciting. Um, so yeah, lots lots of different roles, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow, that that really does sound fascinating. Thank you all. Um, 
Tamlin, I think a good example of being adaptable and flexible um, in our current time. So thanks for that. So I think it nicely moves on to our next question about um, the core skills that you use um, on a day to day basis and not necessarily those technical skills that you honed in the lab at um, university, but the, the softer skills. Um, the ones that we call essential skills or even transferable skills, because those are the ones that you can actually take um, and transfer it into any context you find yourself in. And it's something that we we try to um, help students identify um, those softer skills that they have, because um, often um, they don't even know that they have it. Um, so it'll be interesting to hear, um, you know, the skills that you you use on a day to day basis. So I think I'm going to stick with Tamlin, if I may and then um, Daniel, and then the owner. So over to you, Tamlin. Sure, um, yeah, that, that is definitely a very good point, is um, these skills that uh, can be transferred into the workplace are often those skills you don't learn in your lectures and in your exams. Um, so I think for me, um, people skills, being able to communicate with people, being able to um, share you know, what you're trying to do, share your vision um, and uh, communicate clearly. Um, and communication can be many different ways. It can be in writing, it can be speaking, um, but it's it's basically being able to connect with, with people um, and align with them and, you know, tell them what you're trying to do. And if, if they, they can help you along that journey and, and they're also uh, excited by the vision, then then you can actually go very far together. Um, so I think uh, to, in order to develop communication skills, one one part that helped me a lot was um, building my own self confidence. So you know, really just trying to believe in yourself and make that voice in your head uh, your own best friend. Because I know uh, through the academic um, kind of a track, you do tend to be a bit hard on yourself and you do tend to try to be, you know, perfect. So I think, you know, really try to be kind to yourself and uh, and, and build your own self-esteem and confidence because that'll help you to then communicate um, with others. Um, and I think, yeah, definitely uh, time management skills, being able to, um, you know, take take your week and, and, and plan uh, ahead and, you um, you know, kind of multitask a bit. Um, I think uh, learning is a skill. So being able to teach yourself new skills using the internet. I mean, it's an amazing resource. You can watch YouTube videos. There's all these online courses, short courses. Um, so I think being able to uh, have a growth mindset and continually learn is very helpful. Um, yeah, what else? I think... Uh, yeah, problem solving is something that we do learn um, in, in the lab anyway, and it is then very helpful outside of the lab. So I think all the skills I learned um, in my training at university then helped me in the workplace to solve other problems. Um, so you, you all have problem solving uh, skills. You've all got analytical thinking. Um, so yeah, I think it's definitely finding what, what interests you, what, what floats your boat, um, and what your strengths are, and then trying to align those things and uh, don't listen to anyone else. <laughs> Just uh, whatever uh, you think, uh, whatever skills you have that the world needs. I think that's the alignment, yeah. Thanks, Tamlin, that was really insightful. Um, I like that you said um, you started off with confidence. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's knowing um, that you are unique um, and what you have to offer is unique. Um, and so, so great, um, insightful response um, um, that you've had um, for our students. So thank you for that. So I think I said Danielle next. So over to you, Danielle. Thanks, Megan and Tamlin. Yeah, I think I need to agree with everything that Tamlin has said. I think that's, you know, pretty, universal and really, really great points that she made. Um, I think, yeah, communication and teamwork is really huge. I think especially if you've done a post-grad degree, it's very easy to get used to working in isolation um, because a lot of the time it's really dependent on you and your projects and kind of 
maybe working with your supervisor, getting on with your lab mates, but you're not really forced a lot of the time to to work and produce as a team, which is when you enter the job market, that's a huge reality for for everyone. And then, you know, learning to deal with everything that comes with it. So things like conflict resolution, um, managing other people if necessary. So yeah, that's that's one thing that I feel like if you're doing a postgrad degree and then entering the job market, you might not be necessarily particularly well prepared. Um, yeah, and then good project management. Um, that's a huge part of my role. And I think many other roles as well as just being able to project manage well, be organized, um, be able to um, determine priorities um, to prioritize well to to help you to get through what you need to do um, so yeah I think those are sort of the main things that I feel um, the sort of the softer skills that I've needed to develop um, in, in my career thus far. Danielle, thank you so much for that. Um, another insightful answer coming from you thanks. Um, over to you Fiona. Thanks, and um, thanks to both Tamlin and uh, Danielle. I think I, I feel like they've covered all of them. <laughs> Let me see if I can if I can add um, maybe a couple of a couple of comments. I think um, something that you don't realize that you're learning as a postgraduate student um, is a transferable skill that. Um, I think in my current role, I've realized is quite key, um, and that is the skill of sy building systems. So putting something in place and making sure that it actually functions um, properly and it functions the way it should um, to make sure that at the end of the day you have the outcome that you are expected to produce. Um, and for me, I think the, the all of the pain and suffering that we went through as postgrads, especially um, in the lab, troubleshooting and trying to get something to work and it just wouldn't work and you didn't give up. Um, so I would say in addition that um, and that actually teaches you how to build systems, how to see them through. And um, I think very importantly, perseverance and persistence. Um, so interestingly, Danielle and I actually had the same um, supervisor for our for our postgrad degrees, uh, masters and PhD. And um, she used to tell us all the time, um, perseverance, 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 <laughs> because there are a lot of things that um, don't work for or don't work the way you expected them to and, do, and don't turn out the way you planned them to. But if you can get yourself kind of over that hump, um, and I think that is something really important that uh, working in this particular field um, teaches you as a student, and then uh, you realize that you are applying it every other day in, um, in, in the job uh, market. I certainly am um, persistent and I build systems all day, every day. Um, and I will have to echo um, the important skills of time management. Um, and I recently found a little gem about the fact that balance doesn't really exist. And at any given, which I think has given me a lot of peace <laughs> because um, there are a lot of roles that we play, especially as women. Um, and trying to keep up with everything is just not um, it's not feasible and it's not healthy. <laughs> so as Tamlin started off by saying, uh, be kind to yourself. Realize when something needs to take a back seat and that will involve prioritizing. It does mean that um, for the things that are a priority in any given time, in any given space um, that you're in, then those things do need to get done. But sometimes it's okay to let some other things go. <laughs> you don't have to do everything perfectly. And I will stop there. Thank you, Megan. Um, thank you so much to all of you. Really, like pearls of wisdom um, that I'm sure our students can take away um, from this. And I think it's, it's maybe the appropriate time to mention to our students that um, we actually are having a finding work series. Um, well, we're extending it into the first and second week of um, weeks of December. 
So um, one of the, the, the presentations that we do is actually understanding your skills. Um, so, you know, please feel free to hop onto our website and, and have a look to see the details of that. Um, you might really find it helpful to be able to identify those skills that they've just mentioned and also um, how to actually um, market those skills in order to actually um, become more employable. So um, just I'm mindful of time. Um, it's, it's passing by so quickly because it's really interesting. Um, so I'm, I'm going to I think I'm going to start with the students questions because if I don't, I'm scared I'm, we, we're not going to get through all of them. Um, so I have it on WhatsApp and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go through that. Um, so the first question is, OK, I'll read it verbatim. It's easier. Um, doing a second year major in biochemistry and genetics. So the student says honors is competitive and with limited spaces. How do I secure a post? So perhaps you could indicate who's happy to answer that question by raising your hand physically. <laughs> OK, Danil, you're welcome to um, unmute. Thanks. Um, keep in mind it's going to be difficult for me to answer because I've been out of the honours side of things for about 10 years or so. So I can speak to my experience. Um, it is very difficult. That's just a reality. It's competitive. There are a couple of hundred undergrads from all over the country applying for a handful of honors spots. So it is very difficult. A lot of the time, I, they will use your marks as a first indicator of whether they want you or not. So I want to say that, yes, things are important, like you were a member of so many societies or maybe you know one of the people in the lab, etc. But in undergrad, your marks are really, really important. And that's just the reality. So my advice would be to work hard to do the best that you can. Um, try and get the best marks that you can and then to some degree networking may help so um approaching people who you may want to work with so supervisors in different departments um, dropping them an email asking if you can pop in for five minutes just to chat to them about their research read a couple of their papers so you actually know what you're talking about um that that may be helpful so i don't know i'm sure the other ladies might want to to have um to to jump in but yeah marks are important that's just the reality unfortunately true you're welcome to go tamlin uh, you yes. want to add to that i just wanted to, to agree with danielle and and also to add um, don't don't focus on 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 not getting in and, and everybody else. Um, I know with me, I just had tunnel vision. I was like, I am. This is what I want to do, and I just focused. And you know, for that last year before honors, I didn't have that much of a life, and I just uh, yeah. I remember having I am not a victim stuck on my mirror, and I'm like, <laughs> I like do this, and I just yeah. It was just pure grit, I think, mm -hmm. and perseverance and passion for it. Um, so yeah, just focus, go for it. And if you don't succeed at first, then try again next year, maybe. Um, otherwise, yeah, there are many other things that you could go into. So don't be so narrow minded about one thing if it doesn't work out. Um, and I think just maybe from the career service side to add that um, we could actually assist you with the application. Um, so the motivation later that you have to write, um, you know, can definitely um, feedback. Um, um, regarding that. So, so there's a little bit of assistance, but yes, definitely hard work um, will, will help. So I'm, I'm jumping to the second question from the students. Um, OK, um, good question. Um, second year majoring also in biochemistry and genetics. How do you actually, um, from doing a postgrad in honors or masters, how do you become employable thereafter? 
So I guess they're asking, you know, do you need to do a PhD in order to then step into the world of work or is it sufficient to um, just have your honours or masters? Um, anyone to answer? Fiona? So um, uh, I'll take this one. <laughs> um, so I think one of the things that I didn't um, mention in the previous questions was the fact that to work in a diagnostic environment, you are required to be registered with the Health Professions Council of South Africa. So if you want to be a medical scientist, if you want to work um, uh, in a lab that does testing, in, in the public sector or in the private sector, um, you have to complete this internship, which is um, two year. It's a two year internship. It depends on, there might be some variation depending on where you do it and what level you're at when you do get into the internship. Um, so that internship also very competitive as with honors. Um, we don't take anybody um, pre-honors because you have to have kind of um, learned some of the material from that you would only get um, in honors. So that is one route that um, that is one alternative for um, students that are considering uh, working in this kind of environment, but not necessarily on an academic path. Um, if you do want to be an academic, if you want if you want to be involved in research, if you are passionate about a particular topic or a particular subject, then um, then the academic path is it. Or, or if you are passionate about teaching as well, um, teaching students in any way, shape or form, really, um, then you kind of have to go um, masters and very likely PhD because um, there's there are not many um, positions, not many institutions that will consider you without postgraduate um, training. I hope that answers at least in part. Um, thanks, Fiona. I'm moving on to um, a question actually um, specifically for you, Fiona. Um, oh, I think you've actually answered this because um, you said the type of qualification um, that you need to become a medical scientist. And I think you've actually answered this one. So I'm, I'm moving on to question four. Also for you, Fiona. <laughs> You're popular today. <laughs> so in relation to your postdoc, um, first as researching for yourself and then as managing a grant, did you have to find funding for the running costs and how difficult was that? Um, thanks, Megan, and thanks for the question. Um, so for the, the research that you are interested in personally, I think uh, it is helpful to align yourself with somebody who has similar interests and is more senior. Um, so that's kind of what I did with um, moving to to VITS um, to work with um, one of the professors that I've worked with during my PhD um, because they kind of facilitate you um, starting to find your own feet. Um, I think maybe not unfortunately, but partly unfortunately for me, I chose to work on a very rare condition. Um, so I did my PhD on Huntington disease um, and decided I wanted to explore Huntington disease in African populations a little bit more. Um, but it is really difficult um, to do that because um, because well, genetic conditions in general are quite rare. Huntington disease is particularly rare and it's even more rare in Africa. Um, so I may have shot myself in the foot a little bit. <laughs> so um, we got funding, as I mentioned, I got a, a, a fellowship from Claude Leon, which I don't actually think the foundation gives postdoctoral fellowships anymore, but they were fantastic at the time. Um, there is a lot of funding available uh, for postgraduate students and there is funding available for um, pro there is project funding available through the institutions through the universities there is funding available through government grants um, international funding is ideal if you can wrangle that because um, when you transfer dollars or euros and pounds into rands then you get a lot more money for um, kind of the same amount of work because applying for the funding can be quite um, difficult. So I would say align yourself with somebody senior that is doing the same kind of thing that you want to do 
um, and then just apply. I think my, my first postdoc, um, the second year of my postdoc, I must have written about 10 funding applications, which as I mentioned, unfortunately were not successful. And I think, you know, Huntington disease. Um, <laughs> but I then went on to manage a project that had um, funding had been awarded to the PI from the National Institutes of Health. Um, and then learned a lot from her and I'm re I'm gearing myself up again to kind of dive into the funding application pool um, to get some more uh, money to do my own research. So yeah. Thanks Thank you. That, Anna. <laughs> Good luck with your um, your applications. So um, there's a question. Um, as a biochemistry and genetics major, is it possible to apply for job shadowing or internships at Pathke or even Cape Biofarms um, for more exposure in the science field? So I guess it's over to Daniel and um, Tamlin. So I know that, you know, ideally you want to say to everyone, it's great to do job, job shadowing and internships to get an idea of what the field is like, because often it's completely different to what you might expect coming from a university environment. The reality is that it's very difficult to facilitate that as a company. So um, we get hundreds of emails for people asking to come to do job shadowing and just the nature of our business is that it's very difficult to have um you know a lot of people um walking through our lab every day so as pat care we do have open days um excluding 2020 for obvious reasons so we do have a couple of days a year where um, often it's targeted at high school students, but anyone can come and just have a tour of our reference laboratory, um, chat to some people, get an idea of what path care is all about. Um, so that is sort of a nice, a bit of a taster um, to, to our company. So those are usually advertised on our path care website. Um, and then, yeah, and then you can always take it further um, in various ways. So I personally um, have shown a couple of students around when being asked. So hopefully through those open days, um, you know, you can, can get the contact details of someone who might be able to assist you further. Um, so as Danielle said, I would love to say, yes, everybody come. Um, I'll show you our lab and, you know, tell you everything about what we're doing. But uh, yeah, it, it's also at the moment for us quite, quite uh, manic. Um, everybody is uh, running around uh, <laughs> doing as much as they can in a day. Um, and we've also just scaled up um, our facility and our um, staff. Um, we managed to get a, a nice uh, grant to, to do what we're doing. Um, so we, we are still a bit under construction um, and also obviously with, with COVID at the moment, I think this year it's not possible, but um, in the future I, I will definitely uh, chat to HR and, and chat to our lab manager and maybe we can also do one day and, and um, some students can apply and, and come and visit us and, and we can share what we do um, and, and some tips. So. Yeah, I think I, I would love to do that, um, but um, you are also welcome to, to email. Um, if you look on our website, there, there are some email addresses there. So send through your CV and cover letter and we are expanding next year. So, so you never know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, there are so many questions and um, oh, we've got like 10 minutes left. Um, so pushing on. Um, so, okay, Tamlin says, well done on your achievement. You mentioned you applied for a government grant to conduct research. Were you affiliated with BRU or any other research unit at the time, or did you apply as an independent researcher? So that's for you, Tamlin. Good question. Yeah. So um, my mom, Belinda, and I, we, we applied um, with the BRU. So we actually approached um, Prof. Ed Rubisky and we said, you know, is anyone commercializing your technology locally? He said, nope, nobody's approached me. 
uh, you're welcome to give it a try. Um, and yeah, he actually trusted us to wow. <laughs> write the grant and uh, get the funding. So just a, a preamble to that was um, my mom is an environmental journalist um, and my dad uh, films with her. So she does the editing and the presenting. Um, and they did a story on Brew to kind of investigate further. So they were a bit sneaky um, and they earned his trust. And um, then, yeah. <laughs> so, and then we also, obviously, um, the IP inventors do have shares in the company. So they will benefit as well, uh, as well as UCT was a co-investor in, in the business. So um, yeah, if, if you see a great idea, um, you can sure. always try that. Yeah, yeah. go for it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, oh, okay. Hold on, hold on. Um, so, do any of you have any experience or can speak for what the biomedical field is like in vaccine development? Any takers for that question? <laughs> so, I'll read it again. Any of you have experience or can speak for what the biomedical field is like in vaccine development? Um, so, so all I do know is that it is a uh, you, you need CGMP compliance to develop vaccines, which is a very high regulatory uh, level. So, I think BioVac has this um, Aspen. Um, so, all I know is it is a lot of paperwork. It's very strict, um, and that's about my my experience. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Um, we're almost there. Um, we have nine minutes left. Um, Okay, so Daniel, from your experience, how likely is it to disrupt the local diagnostic industry? Um, it's a difficult question to ask or to answer. Mm. I think uh, as a laboratory offering a diagnostic or diagnostic tests, a lot of laboratories don't necessarily want to disrupt the industry. We all want to do the right thing and often we're all doing the same thing. Um, disruption, I think, will often come from product development side rather than internally from the diagnostic laboratories. That being said, we do try and obviously implement new techniques and technologies with the tests that we're offering. Um, but one may argue about whether that's that's really disruption or not. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question appropriately. I'm not sure if Fiona wants to, <laughs> to chip in as well. Um, but yeah, often we will we also have various regulations that we try to adhere to when offering a diagnostic test. So there are ISO standards, there are standards um, implemented by the HPCSA, which is, so those are all regulatory standards which everyone needs to adhere to. Um, and the moment that you go away from those, it becomes, quite difficult and can make your life quite difficult. So um, that wasn't a particularly well formulated answer, but um, it's a bit of a tricky question to answer. Yeah, that is a tricky one. Um, do you want to add anything, Fiona, or are you happy to move on? I think I think you would have to agree with Danielle in that um, because, of, because what we do is so sensitive, it is very, very tightly regulated. Um, so, you know, when we talk about disruption, we're kind of referring to, as I understand it, coming into the field and shaking things up, so to speak. Right. Um, it's really difficult to do that in in a way that that stays within the guidelines uh, that are already very um, very prescribed. Um, there are a few big players <laughs> in the in this particular um, field, and you need you would need a lot of money. To comply with every single regulation, so there there would there would be a lot of things that need to be um, ticked off in order to to enter the field. Never mind um, shaking anything. Up. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, Fiona, this is actually for you as well. So, it reads: I'm a master's student studying biomedical forensic science. 
how long does it take typically for a new diagnostic test genetically or otherwise to be validated and implemented? Um, thank you. That's an interesting question. Um, and I maybe a difficult question also because it's kind of like asking how long does it take to do a PhD <laughs> or a master's project? And I think the short answer would be it's very, very variable. It depends on um, the technique that you are using. Um, so there are some um, there are some diagnostic tests that are based on a simple approach, um, for example, a PCR, and that might take you, you know, a few weeks to optimize, and then you need um, another couple of months to validate. So that would be on the market, so to speak, um, in a few months. Um, the test that I'm currently over seeing, which is uh, a microarray. Um, approach that we're using for chromosome changes um, that we have been trying to optimize and validate as a department for five years. <laughs> so, like I said, it's very, I mean, we've got some data, it's looking good, um, but again, we're coming back to systems and processes. Um, it's a bit more complicated to set up um, because it is a very um, sensitive test. Um, sensitive in the sense that there are things that may or may not work depending on the temperature outside. Um, that kind of thing. So when you have something like that, it takes much longer. Um, so yeah, the answer, it's, it, it varies. I see Tamlin has a hand up. Go for the Tamlin. Yes, no, I just wanted to say that um, I think uh, for Fiona's test, it, it's something completely new, which obviously takes uh, time to develop. Um, but for kind of antibody rapid test kits that are, you know, quite uh, um, standard in, in the field um, and the format has already been developed, um, we worked with the one test kit manufacturer here locally um, and he went from getting our antigen, um, he, he used capture antibodies that he was already using and that he had optimized. So it was just our antigen and conjugating to the gold and developing the rapid test kit. Um, that took about two months for him to finish the R&D, but obviously he fast-tracked this because of the, you know, the pandemic. It was a whole different uh, context. Um, and yeah, we, we managed to get SARPA approval um, three months later. So I think total five months from beginning till getting the, the, the validation from SARPA, um, which we are very excited about because it's a locally made antibody test kit. Um, so, yeah, it really does depend on what the test is and, and what the reagents are in the format. Um, thank you for that. So, I'm, I'm, I'm appearing distracted because I'm all these questions and I'm jumping around. Um, there was a question for Fiona again um, from an international student, and I'm trying to find where it is, and I'm not finding it. Um, and I think that will probably have to be our last question. Um, so just bear with me. I ah, got it bonded. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as an international student um, in South Africa, how was the experience um, of securing funding and subsequently jobs? Are you able to explain your process? Um, and I apologize to those who have sent through questions. We'll try to make way to um, to answer them, um, but just to give us some time after the event. So over to you, um, Fiona. Thanks, Megan. Um, I, I mean, maybe just to say that I'm very happy to continue the conversations and to answer any questions um, subsequent to this, because an hour is a really short time to have conversations about career journeys, because um, it has turned into a journey. It's no longer a career path. Um, you don't kind of go um, along a nice linear, linear um, route. Um, so back to the question. As an international student, um, bottom line, it's really difficult. Um, Danielle will probably remember me spending days crying <laughs> on her shoulder about um, the fact that I was not eligible for most of the funding that um, was available to postgraduate students. Um, it becomes a little more difficult when you uh, when you exit. Um, uh, studentship, so to speak. Um, so getting research funding is also quite difficult, quite challenging. Um, but having said that, it's not impossible. 
Um, and I would advise for international students, um, focus more on international funding um, bodies, uh, more so than the South African funding bodies, simply because um, there are limited funds available across the country, and rightly so, um, the investments are being made, I think, in um, citizens. And this applies to all countries. I mean, it applies across the world. Um, so focus on international funding that's available. That is possible. Um, and in terms of the job um, market, maybe this is how I ended up doing a couple. Of, I think I was a postdoc for four almost five years. <laughs> um, so it, it um, uh, the postdoc track, because you kind of join a project that may already have funding available and will be, will be able to offer you a fellowship. Um, so that helps if um, that's the kind of direction that you want to go towards. Um, if you are, if you have the opportunity to do the internship, as I mentioned, for the HPCSA registration, um, that's a great um, route because then that facilitates your registration with a recognized South African body and um, gives you options. Um, and maybe lastly, just to say that you, uh, I think the, the immigration law has changed in the last, um, five, six years or so. Uh, if you have, I think it might be a master, I could be mistaken, it might be all the way to PhD. I think if you do have a PhD, you are eligible for a critical skills permit, um, which then allows you to apply for jobs and allows you to work in the country legally, which is ideal. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there are a couple, there are a couple of options. Um, I didn't benefit from the critical skills visa because at the time I was um, finishing up my studies, it was not available. Um, but yeah, there are there are things that I have since um, discovered that I'm happy to pass on um, for the benefit of international students. It is difficult, it is challenging, but it's not impossible. Um, so thank you so thank you. very much. Um, for answering that question and, and thank you for um, allowing our students to engage with you so thoroughly. I'm sure that they have um, been inspired um, um, by all of you. So thank you for your time and thank you to our students for attending. I know it's critical um, time for preparation with exams. So thank you for spending this, this valuable time with us. And then as well as reminded me, I see it's on the chat, please fill in the form. Um, and then we're also offering a CV lab on the 4th of December. It falls on a Friday, so please feel free to check out the website. I've mentioned the Finding Work series um, as well. All the details are there. Um, and I just wanted to say, yeah, last but not least, thanks to the Career Service for supporting um, the event, um, as well as especially in England and the rest of you. Um, yeah, so thank you. Go well and take care. Keep safe. Bye now. Thank you, Megan. And thank you. Thanks, Fiona. See you. You're welcome to switch off <laughs> <laughs> your your cameras. <laughs> Bye. Bye.